Good morning, if you are in the West Coast, like I am in California, and good afternoon, if you are in the East Coast, like our chair and discussant are, and good evening, if you are actually joining us from across the ocean, like our speaker Sharon is, uh, she is joining us from Istanbul. My name is Baki, Baki Tezjan. I teach history uh, at the University of California in Davis. And um, I'm going to briefly share my screen with you to introduce the panel uh, for a second. Uh, you are all here. You know, you signed up for this. Furnishing the Ottoman Empire, Crystal Objects and Sacred Spaces. And uh, the chair of the panel, uh, mo our moderator, Professor Zeynep Çelik, will introduce the speaker and the discussant in a second. I'm here to just remind you, we have another meeting coming up next Friday. Uh, in our Turkey Now series. Uh, it's called 100 Years, 100 Objects, Yüz Sene, Yüz Nesne, An Alternative History of Turkey in the Centennial of the Republic. It's a collaborative project uh, that is done mostly by academics who were uh, who experienced a purge uh, in the aftermath of the um, Academics for Peace petition. So many of the contributors to this um, online encyclopedia are people who no longer work in academia because they, they've been fired from Turkish universities. They got together and pr are producing this encyclopedia. We will be um, selectively translating some of them and publishing them in our journal next year when the encyclopedia will become online. And next week, uh, you'll get a chance to have a sneak preview of uh, what this encyclopedia is about and how we are uh, doing about the translation, which is also a collaborative effort. So the whole thing is a great example of collaboration. And then our next WhatsApp meeting in November is on November 11th uh, on Veterans Day. Uh, Professor um, uh, Fariba Zarinaba from my colleague at uh, UC Riverside and Professor Linda Darling from University of Arizona, uh, they recently uh, co-edited a book, uh, a commemorative volume for their hoja, Halil Bey, Halil Inalcik, whom we lost a few years ago. So in that WhatsApp meeting, um, the contributors to that volume will uh, remember Halil Bey and uh, also talk about uh, his contributions to the Ottoman historiography. So I hope you can make that one. Uh, today, our uh, moderator, uh, Professor Zeynep Çelik, is probably uh, our most published colleague. Uh, it is very humbling uh, to look at uh, her long list of publications. She is currently uh, Sakip Sabanji visiting professor uh, in the history department at Columbia University. And here you are looking at a selection, only a selection of her books. Uh, let me uh, especially uh, underline that the uh, remaking of Istanbul was one of the first, if not the first recipients of Otsa's book awards at the time before it was called uh, Fuat Köprülü, at the time it was called the Institute of Turkish Studies Book Award. Uh, I think she received it almost the year it was uh, introduced for the first time. And the second book you see there is Empire, Architecture and the City, French and Ottoman Encounters, received the Society of Architectural Historians Book Award. And as I said, they are only a selection. Uh, I if I were to introduce uh, Zeynep Çelik the way she deserves, we would have to stay here for 15 minutes. And I'm not going to do that. I will be uh, taking refuge in her understanding and pass the button to her for her to introduce today's speaker and discuss. And Zeynep Ojam, thank you so much for making time to uh, moderate this session. And for the audience members, please raise your hands or use the chat function uh, if when you have questions, uh, the question and answer will follow the presentation and the commentary by our discussant uh, it, toward the end of the hour. But feel free to raise your hand earlier to get online or write a question in chat. Okay, say please. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tezjan, for this very generous introduction. I am blushing, I blushed, but fortunately none of you saw it. 
I'm very pleased to serve as the moderator to Sharon Mizbani's presentation today, titled Furnishing the Ottoman Empire, Crystal Objects in Sacred Spaces, the winner of OTSA's Graduate Student Paper Prize last year. Sharon Mizbani is a PhD candidate at Yale University, specializing in the comparative architectural history of the late Ottoman Empire and Qajar Iran. Her particular focus is on the development of urban water infrastructure and related monuments during the 19th and 20th centuries. In 2021, she presented aspects of her research at the Voices of Emerging Scholars seminar series, which I host for the Columbia Global Center in Istanbul. An article based on this presentation entitled The Art of Infrastructure, Hamidiye Fountains in Late Ottoman Istanbul, was published in the Journal of the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association. Our discussant is Deniz Türker, an assistant professor of Islamic art and architecture at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. She specializes in late Ottoman and Turkish visual and material cultures. Her forthcoming book, The Accidental Palace, Penn State Press 2022, I guess very soon, traces the architectural and landscape history of Yildiz, the last Ottoman palace in Istanbul. She also has an interest in the history of Islamic art collecting, especially in the 19th century Ottoman and Egyptian contexts. Her next project is centered on Yildiz Moran's photographic practice in the context of Anatolia's rediscovery by Turkish humanists in the 1950s. Quite a jump from palaces to Anatolian um, Anatolian folk art. Good. With this, let's give the word to Sharon now. Great. Thank you so much, Professor, for that introduction. And thank you, everyone, for coming. And um, before I start, I wanted to take this opportunity to use this platform to express my solidarity and frankly, awe for the Iranian people and particularly women at this moment. And then every moment fighting for their freedom, we're all watching and the world is watching. Um, great, so everyone should see my screen now. In June of 1846, to the acclaim and pride of the Birmingham press, Ibrahim Pasha of Egypt left his diplomatic business in London to tour their city's factories and foundries. <laughs> Among the vast world of commodities produced in Birmingham, one drew special interest. The Pasha, the British press noted, quote, paid particular attention to the process of glassmaking in its various stages, end quote. In fact, he was already well acquainted with the work of one Birmingham-based glassmaking company, FNC Osler, which we see an advertisement for here, which had previously been commissioned to supply a brass and crystal chandelier for a new mosque in Alexandria. Apparently impressed, the Pasha soon placed an order for the same company for an enormous pair of candelabra. The largest that have ever been that had ever been designed to that date, made almost entirely of cut crystal glass upon a gilded hexagonal base and weighing over 2,000 pounds. Upon their completion the following year, the candelabra were declared by the Art Union Journal as a quote, work of the highest po possible merits and perhaps the greatest achievement that has yet been accomplished in the British industrial art, end quote. And we can see the art journal included an illustration on the right, and we have another one on the left from the Illustrated London News. However, Ibrahim Pasha did not live to see them completed. He died in 1848, and it would be his successor, Abbas Pasha, who would see the candelabra delivered to their ultimate destination, the Mosque of the Prophet Muhammad in Medina, flanking the Prophet's burial chamber. 
Commenting upon the news that the candelabra were due to arrive in Medina, Charles Dickens, in 1852, the editor-in-chief of the journal Household Words, described their imminent arrival as a symbolic incident in the history of British glass industry. It marked, he argued, quote, the spread of British arts among the remotest regions and strangest races and faiths on earth, end quote. For Dickens, the candelabra were material ambassadors for British industrial supremacy, manufacturing prowess, and cultivated taste. Although placed within the most sacred spaces of Islam, in this worldview, the candelabra would remain separate in character and quintessentially British. As the tomb of the prophet was close to non-Muslims, Dickens concluded that Abbas Pasha had in fact performed something of an imperial tribute in finally delivering them to Medina. He had allowed British objects to infiltrate into a space where British subjects were still unable to enter. Yet, when Richard Francis Burton made the pilgrimage to Mecca and Medina and visited the Mosque of the Prophet, his reaction was rather disdainful. As recorded in his 1855 personal narrative of a pilgrimage to al Medina and Mecca, Burton was shocked at the mosque's mean and tawdry appearance compared to the grand and simple architecture of Mecca. But most disturbing of all, he wrote, quote, it is disfigured by handsome branched candelabras of cut crystal, the work, I believe, of a London house and presented to the shrine by the late Abbas Pasha of Egypt, end quote. For Burton, the candelabra served as an unwelcome reminder of British modernity and consumer products in a putatively timeless and sacred space. Nevertheless, we might know a certain commonality to the descriptions of both Dickens and Burton. For both writers, the candelabra were something out of place, objects which remain, dis uh, remain distinct from the architecture of the sacred space as a whole, and acted like a British splinter in the heart of the Orient. It could be said that the assumptions of these two paradigmatic Victorian men persist in art historical categorizations. Because of their point of origin, method of manufacture, style, and the accessibility of British sources, objects like these candelabra are placed squarely outside of the realm of Islamic art, despite being set inside one of the most sacred spaces of Islam. However, be Precisely because these candelabra were placed in such a well-documented and regularly visited space, we have a wealth of sources speaking to alternative understandings of the candelabra. In what follows, I trace out some of these different modes of understanding, the views of the British press, as already discussed, the Ottoman state and its representatives, as well as Egyptian and Iranian pilgrims. The point is not to invalidate the perspective of Dickens and Burton as wrong or inauthentic, nor to contrast an essentialized Islamic or Eastern conceptualization of lighting and space with a British or Western one. This is the pitfall that has trapped much of the current historiography on the consumption of imported glassware in the Islamic world into reifying notions of an original Eastern or Western sensibility. Rather, it is to explore how candelabra, chandeliers, and other imported glassware were able to sustain a variety of interpretations dependent upon one's conceptualization of imperial power and sacred space. To be sure, the consumption of imported glassware had a long history amongst the Ottoman elite. During the era of Safiya Sultan, for example, the woman of the imperial harem consumed enough Murano glass to cause the import of certain fashionable products to be banned. Through the practice, uh, practices such as the Chiran festival, the play of the light and glass became an integral component to royal ceremonies during the 18th century. Furthermore, Ottoman sultans, in competition with the Safavids in eras, areas like Iraq, made use of imported glass and ainakari, or mirror work, to decorate sacred spaces such as shrines and tombs. In this sense, the trans-imperial network of production, exchange, and consumption were not innovations of the 19th century, nor was the emplacement of imported European glass in Ottoman mosques a radical departure from previous practices. 
During the 19th century, however, notable structural changes took place in terms of technological capacity, scale of production, and the increasing speed of communication, which intensified already existing global networks of glass consumption and recentered the locus of manufacture away from Venice to new industrial cities in Britain, France, and Austria-Hungary. Yet we, may, we might already detect in Dickens' statement a more subtle shift. Although clearly not discounting the symbolic significance of the royal consumer, for Dickens, it is clear that the imperial prestige accrued primarily to the manufacturer of such glassware. Furthermore, royal consumption of these products were seen as a statement of British cultural hegemony and even as an act of tribute on the part of the foreign monarch. And here uh, on your screen, you see an advertisement for uh, another glass company, De Fries and Sons, which su supplied uh, Domobace Palace with lots of chandeliers and candelabra. And here in the advertisement, it clearly states that the, one of their consumers, one of their customers is the Sultan of Turkey, as well as the Queen. Uh, and Prince of Wales. And so we have these manufacturers providing glass to palaces all over the world. This represented a rather different conceptualization of the tributary relationship between producer and consumer that had shaped the Ottoman consumption of Venetian glass, for example. The consumption of glassware in the Ottoman Empire during the 19th century showed evidence of these economic transformations in the ways that imperial competition were conceptualized through the participation in global market for brand name luxury products. Perhaps one of the most more visible expressions of this competition was in the maintenance and embellishment of sacred spaces, particularly within borderland zones of intensive inter-imperial contestation, such as Ottoman Iraq. As a rather panicked archival record from May 1898 shows, the display of imported glassware was a crucial element in this competition. Writing back to Istanbul, the governor of Baghdad province complained that Mozaffar Adin Shah, the ruler of Iran, had commissioned numerous chandeliers from Europe to decorate the tomb of the seventh Shi'i Imam Musa al Qazim in the Al Qazimiya Mosque in Baghdad. By contrast, the nearby tomb of the founder of the Sunni Hanafi school, Abu Hanifa, was lit only by, quote, an ordinary 20 kurush petrol lamp that brings great sadness and shame to all who see it, end quote. Recognizing that an earlier donation of, quote, a rather valuable and artistic chandelier to the tomb of the Sunni mystic Abdel Qadir Gilani had continuously filled eyes with light and pride, the governor requested that a chandelier of at least 10,000 kurush and uh, more beautiful than the chandeliers of the Iranian Shah be sent to Istanbul, from Istanbul as soon as possible. What is remarkable is not only that these pieces of imported glassware were placed unproblematically into statements of imperial pious competition, but that the framework through which these, this competition was expressed was the commercial value and fashionability of these products on the global market. It is in this light that we can understand how the FNC Osler candelabra commissioned by Ibrahim Pasha were embedded in imperial discourses on two levels. On one hand, Ibrahim Pasha's trip to Birmingham and the reactions of the British press testify to an increasing prominence of the producer rather than the consumer in the accrual of imperial prestige. Certainly, it is true that no Safavid Shah or Ottoman Sultan ever visited the glass workshops at Morano, but in 1889, Nasr al-Din Shah uh, did follow Ibrahim Pasha in visiting the FNC Osler showrooms in Birmingham, and his successor, Mozaffar al-Din Shah, went to Baccarat Crystal Foundry in France, and Baccarat is well known for its uh, chandeliers and candelabra in Domobace, as well as Golestan, um, also pieces in, uh, in East Asia, um, France, Britain. At the same time, Ibrahim Pasha's placement of enormous and technologically advanced candelabra in the Mosque of the Prophet represented an Egyptian foray into the competition for symbolic and pious leadership over the Islamic world, a discourse within which British manufacture was not the dominant way of reading these objects. 
In the 1830s, in the midst of war between Sultan Mahmud II and his nominal vassal Muhammad Ali Pasha of Egypt, the Ottoman state undertook intensive renovations in Mecca and Medina to assert its special role as the servant of the two sacred cities. Considering that the uh, Ottoman government had earlier lost these cities in the Ottoman Wahhabi War and had only reclaimed them with the help of Ibrahim Pasha and his forces, it is unsurprising that the sacred spaces of Mecca and Medina became the focal point of Egyptian symbolic competition with the Ottoman Sultan. The candelabra commissioned from FNC Osler by Ibrahim Pasha and finally bequeathed to the Mosque of the Prophet by Abbas Pasha represented a significant intervention into a space crucial to the narrative of Ottoman imperial legitimacy. As archival records show, this was no easy matter. The Egyptian government was forced to dispatch notices to Medina in order to ensure that the goods were not rejected by surprise Ottoman officials, as well as received with due pomp and circumstance. Generally speaking, the supply of candles and oil for light in prominent mosques was supported by the establishment of a vakuf, or pious foundation, which also helped to pay the wages of the mosque employees who would light them. And here we can see in this photo from 1916, uh, one of these employees lighting the crystal, uh, crystal candelabra donated by Abbas Pasha, which has been moved by this time, so that's why it's not next to the burial chamber. The act of charity in this sense was not only in the bequest, but in its constant maintenance and in the unwavering illumination of the sacred space. In the case of Abbas Pasha's bequest, archival records note that he died before a vakuf for this purpose could be established. Because of this, the candles would ultimately be supplied from the Ottoman Ministry of Pious Foundations. Likely to compete with Abbas Pasha's donations, Sultan Abdul Majid quickly responded by uh, launching his own donation program. Immediately in 1854, he purchased 2,500 lamps for the Tomb of the Prophet, and three years later, he dispatched the Ottoman-Armenian court jeweler Bogos Bey Duzian to Vienna to purchase an additional 2,500 crystal lamps for the Tomb of the Prophet and another 3,500 for holy spaces in Mecca. In 1858, he tasked the imperial mint with ornamenting a pair of candelabra that perhaps he hoped would outdo those of Ibrahim Pasha. Although unable to reproduce immense crystal objects on the scale of FNC Osler candelabra, keep in mind that was the largest ever made, Abdul Majid instead ordered Bogos Bey to adorn the gilded columns of his own pair with 300,000 Majidiyah worth of diamonds and other precious jewels. In 1880s, when the Ottoman naval official Ayub Sabri Pasha composed his comprehensive five-volume survey of Mecca, Medina, and the Arabian Peninsula, entitled Mirror of the Two Holy Cities, Miratul Haramein, his description of Abbas Pasha's bequest was almost entirely prosaic. Almost 100 pages of the nearly 1,400-page volume on Medina consisted of an inventory of the Mosque of the Prophet, of these 100 pages, only a single page detailed the bequests of Abbas Pasha. Ayub Sabri's description of the crystal candelabra, Bilur Shemdan, was limited exclusively to mundane logistic matters, such as how they were sent from Egypt. The physical descriptions of these works only went so far as to note their large size and number of candles. No mention was made whatsoever of Britain, let alone that these were the nation's greatest achievement in industrial arts. By contrast, Ayub Sabri was full of immense praise for the pair of candelabra commissioned by Sultan Abdul Majid, marveling at the beautiful and bejeweled objects, shining with the light of 16,282 pieces of brilliant stone. Ayub Sabri made clear that these were also proof of imperial and communal piety. Not only did the duty to light the candelabra fall to the high officials of the mosque, uh, with the city's judges taking over the role on Fridays, but even the ordinary inhabitants of the city were depicted as having a deep reverence for the symbol of the Sultan's charity. When the Egyptian general Ibrahim Refat Pasha published his own Hajj narrative, the similarly titled Miratul Haramein, his descriptions of the glassware within the mosque of the Prophet was somewhat more balanced. Although published later, this book did detailed Ibrahim Refat's pilgrimage from 1901 to 1908. 
full of praise for the bequest of Abdul Majid, noting, quote, the two large candelabra he sent made of pure gold and adorned with magnificent diamonds, end quote. He nevertheless was the first was first drawn to the almost 50 year old candelabra and chandelier donated by Abbas Pasha which he described as still the grandest objects in the mosque, so large that they hit the ceiling in the Qibla section. The chandeliers, too, were remarkable for their crystal brilliance, and Ibrahim Jafat both detailed their particular style and included photographs for good measure. And here's a photograph from um, his book um, from 1908, I believe. That the British had claimed that the very same candelabra as their imperial proxy within the mosque of the Prophet was obscured in Ibrahim Rafat's account, which, like that of Ayub Sabri, Pasha made no mention of Britain whatsoever. In addition to numerous written accounts and photographs of the candelabra in the Mosque of the Prophet, it is worthwhile here to make a preliminary comparison to what was almost certainly the most widespread and mass-produced visual representation of the candelabra during the 19th century and afterwards. That is, the printed certificates which were sold as souvenirs to Hajj pilgrims. As Ulrich Marzolf has argued, Pilgrim certificates, quote, attest to the transformation of geographical places into visually constructed sacred spaces and of terrestrial geography into religious topography, end quote. The depiction of the Mosque of the Prophet in these certificates thus had a particular imminent quality in which architectural space was reconfigured into an ideal sacral form. In this regard, the profusion of lamps, chandeliers, and candelabra, which are visible in these representations, are striking. For example, in this Harch certificate shown, lamps are depicted throughout the interior spaces, hanging between each of the archways and corridors in the building. So I will, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but uh, here's an example. Between each archway is a lamp. Um, and uh, in the midget, image to the left, so the very left one here, depicting the Mosque of the Prophet, there are three ornate conical chandeliers outlined in yellow and orange hanging from the crossbeams and which may represent a set of crystal pillared tree chandeliers that Ibrahim Rifat described as donated by Sultan Abdul Majid. So I will show you a close up of that part here. So here's the chandeliers and here are the candelabra. Below and between these chandeliers are four candelabra depicted in the interior space, which bear a strong resemblance to those gifted by Abbas Pasha and Sultan Abdul Majid. Although their position within the mosque interior and not flanking the tomb itself suggests a more schematic representation of both the Ottoman and Egyptian bequests, or else a later Ottoman addition. As you can see, it doesn't name which candelabra they are, just that they are candelabra. In any case, they are nevertheless depicted as an essential and inseparable element of the architectural space, so important to the sacral geography of the mosque that they visually dominate its interior. Far from being marked by their foreign quality within the schematized vocabulary of pilgrimage certificates, they were an annotated simply as lights, kanadil, or tree lights, shajere uh, kanadil. Such labels likely reflected a more common experience of the space, which was less like less directly interested in the imperial machinations of the British, Ottoman, and Egyptian states. When the Iranian traveler Mirza Mohammad Hussein Farahani visited the tomb of the Prophet in 1886, for example, he noted only that among the candlesticks, chandeliers, and numerous candelabra of the mosque, there were two large jewel-studded examples lit during pilgrimage season, which we may presume were those donated by Abdul Majid because of their jeweled qualities. In this sense, within the visual, visual language of the certificate, these pieces of imported glassware appeared not as discrete, nameable objects per se, but as aspects of a more holistic conceptualization of the sacred space in the holy city, a city coincidentally honored as Medina i uh, Munevere, or Enlightened Medina. And here I just want to show another example. I found um, quite a handful of late 19th century uh, hot certificates showing candelabra and chandeliers. And um, here's another one. There is, of course, vast amount of scholarship. 
let me just go back here. Um, there is, of course, vast amount of scholarship on the significance of the lamp as a metaphor for divine light in Islamic tradition. Within this context, then, it is unsurprising that the imported glassware was generally able to be integrated into the visual iconography of the mosque. An architectural diagram of the Tomb of the Prophet produced by the Iranian pilgrim uh, Farhad Mirza Muatama for his own 1875 Hajj narrative is, case, is a case in point. Although interested almost wholly in what we might term normatively architectural features seen from a, from a flattened top-down perspective, so we have the four, floor plan, we have the walls, and each circle here represents a uh, column. Within the interior space, he has also depicted and labeled two bejeweled candelabra, Shemdan in profile. So here they are. So clearly not the candelabra, just uh, some other candle holders. Um, marking them both as integral to the architecture of the space and distinct elements with it, their own particular dimensionality. In fact, in the very center of the diagram, Farhad Mirza writes, quote, a door which one enters at night to light the lamps. Darike az inja shabha dakhilish and charaq roshan mikonand. Emphasizing both the importance of the light fixtures themselves and the ritual act of illuminating the space. In this regard, both the Hajj certificates and Farhad Mirza's diagram begin to reveal a particular relationship between objects and architecture, which can add to the theorization of both categories, while blurring the boundaries between the two. Once in place in the sacred space, the candelabra act acted as a structural feature, almost like a column, rather than as movable objects to be added or removed at whim. This metaphysical understanding in which the candelabra exists in triangulation between the physical realm of the building, the symbolic realm of the divine light, and the ritual participation of the pilgrim, the candelabra attendant, and its imperial patron, allowed for these objects, which sit uneasily in the category of Islamic art, to have been emplaced without any perceived dissonance within the most unambiguously Islamic spaces. Ultimately, in 1917, with the prospect of the Ottoman defeat in the First World War increasingly evident, the garrison commander of Medina, Omer Fahreddin Pasha, began to transfer to Istanbul as much movable material out of the mosque of the Prophet as possible. By 1919, when after four years of siege, he was compelled to surrender Medina to the forces of the Hashemite King Abdullah I, the interior of the mosque had largely been stripped of its historical bequests, including thousands of lambs. The Abdul Majid candelabra were among the few remaining objects left near the tomb of the Prophet, and I actually do not know what has happened to the Abbas Pasha candelabra. But we, there's still pictures of pilgrims today taking photos of themselves with the Abdul Majid one. The remaining glassware of the Mosque of the Prophet continues to figure in the current contestation for symbolic leadership of the region. In 1975, the head of the Austrian glass company, Loeb Mayer, was invited to Saudi Arabia to inspect the remaining chandeliers and candelabra in the holy spaces of Mecca and Medina. As a company catalog pr proudly recounted, he expressed his shock at the presence of such European glassware in what he assumed to be the most ancient building of Islam, and recommended the removal of what they deemed, quote, the chandeliers of the infidels' ballrooms, and their replacement with glassware in the ancient Islamic art and style. And this is a quote from their brochure. In 1986, Loebmeyer completely renovated the glassware of the Mosque of the Prophet in Medina, replacing the aged pieces of what they claimed to be inauthentic imported glassware with a, quote, modern Islamic design deeply rooted in the culture and traditional aesthetics, end quote. It may come as no surprise that these authentically Islamic objects, which we see here, were manufactured in Vienna. Thank you. Sharon, thank you so much. I, I picked up the baton. Um, hopefully that's okay uh, with everybody. 
Um, uh, thank you, of course, to, ba uh, to Baki for, for involving me in this uh, wonderful gathering and, uh, and, and to, uh, uh, to Zeynep Çelik for, um, for, the, for the kind introduction. Uh, Sharon, it's a beautifully constructed um, paper, uh, very enlightening with all puns uh, intended. Um, you, um, you know, take us across, uh, uh, you know, ver various sort of contestations by looking at, you know, singular objects, uh, which I find commendable. Um, you know, for me, for someone who's very interested in, 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 in precisely the rivalry between Ottoman uh, material culture and, and Egyptian um, um, uh, material culture of the 19th century, this was particularly important um, uh, to, um, uh, to read. Um, you know, and 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 you and you you phrase it so beautifully as as this sort of proxy glass warfare, which seems to um, not only happen necessarily between on the imperial scale between Abdul Majid and Ibrahim Pasha, uh, but also through the memoirs of their state officials. So when you look at Ayub Sabri's way of approaching these objects uh, uh, in this holy space, he very definitively allies himself with Abdul Majid's patronage uh, while. Ahmed, uh, while Ibrahim Rafat uh, highlights uh, Abbas Pasha's um, uh, uh, bequest to this site, which uh, which is um, very very interesting, very sort of exceptionally political. Um, I also really love how you uh, um, approach uh, these objects as having as as embodying um, shifting. Uh, meanings that uh, they're sort of their indexicality is constantly shifting depending on who's looking at them right and so and that's not just in the Ottoman and Egyptian context but the Brits who you know some of them read you know their techno material superiority and then there are others like uh, uh, you know the, the the Burton who goes native um, who sees them completely out of space out of place in this sacred site site um, of course, then there's also uh, the the place of glass in other uh, um, you know contested or charged regions that you construct so well. Um, um, the rivalry between Ottoman Sufism and 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 Shi Iran through uh, you know the, the you know the awareness that the Ottomans have that the Abu Hanifa tomb is completely under glass while very close by the Al Kazimiya Mosque is uh, is 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 gloriously illuminated at all times, um, and then you take that rivalry all the way to the to the to the contemporary moment, and I, I you know to our audience here, I read a longer version of this paper, so I have more examples than the ones that that that, that Sharon offered um, in the presentation where uh, uh, the, the, the Republic of Turkey and Saudi Arabia are constantly still battling out who are better or who were better stewards of these sites, um, especially through uh, these uh, uh, these lighting features, which I I, I find um, very exciting that the paper brings us all the way to the um, um, to the to the um, to the present moment. Uh, you also. And it's not necessarily, you didn't bring Alina Payne into the picture here in your presentation, but it was there in the paper and I loved it so much um, um, uh, that, that I want to introduce it to our audience and maybe you want to sort of expound on it. If I misunderstand, maybe you should um, um, you know, also use a moment to, 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 to correct me. But, but you borrowed this sort of shifting meanings attributed to the candelabra um, through Alina Payne's work on, um, uh, uh, on Klein architecture, that is Klein architecture, that is small architecture um, um, that allows for users and viewers uh, um, um, uh, to, to um, to create in their approach a kind of epistemological ambiguity um, in, in how they're experiencing um, uh, these objects and spaces, but also the fact that they at some point, these sort of Klein architectures at some point become so embedded in the site itself through rituals constructed around them, uh, that they become immovable, not, not only physically immovable, but also I guess the word that you used um, is haptically immovable. That is, they're you know they're 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 present um, 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 there. They're sort of fixed. Their presence is fixed in the space. Um, you also very elegant elegantly weave in um, glass and also mirrored glass um, as symbols of enlightened rule. You know, 
in, in quotations, and you bring in, of course, Versailles, um, uh, it, you know, in your longer paper. Um, um, so you, European uh, uh, approach to, to glass as the ultimate material uh, um, uh, that represents uh, the king or or, 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 or or imperial might or imperial power. Uh, but also you bring in, um, uh, um, you know, Dolmabache, uh, Dolmabache is, you know, over indexing on, on glass um, objects within it and also architectural features. Um, um, I think in some ways, precisely because it's the reform period, right? And so, you know, we, we you know, associate a, Mejid's patronage with a desire to come across as, uh, as an enlightened, uh, uh, ref, you know, reformist uh, ruler. Um, and, 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 and also going back to Selim III, occasionally you, you do mention that, that he employs a, a Mevlevi Dervish uh, to go and learn the ways of glassmaking in 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 Murano, which I think is 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 also behaving in that realm of a point of proto um, uh, proto reformist uh, ruler, uh, you know, um, uh, and 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 you know, um, the sort of glass use of glass as a material as a material manifestation of um, of that, and here. Um, you know, I, uh, the, the, you know, Abdul Majid also brings in, 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 in to Dolmabachi, and maybe this is something you've already seen, and maybe it's not, you know, it doesn't, it, it doesn't have a place in whatever this paper might end up going, but he also uh, commissions a crystal palace he calls Billur Sarai, or it appears as Billur Sarai in uh, um, in the you know in Boa in, in the Ottoman archives that we we use, which is brought over from from England. I'm not quite I don't know I wrote something on this some years ago, but I don't exactly know. I think it was Birmingham, but but a different. Uh, it's a shipbuilders company that that is commissioned to uh, to to structure this Billur Sarai. But what is very exciting about your paper is that Ibrahim Pasha's commission is is a 1847, which is which precedes the Crystal Palace exhibition. So there is, uh, you know, between the Ottomans and Egyptians, this constant rivalry over who gets the first, who gets who gets first dibs on whatever they uh, they they commission. And so it seems like Ibrahim Pasha actually sort of wins in this uh, uh, in this uh, in this rivalry. But the other thing that I uh, was very um, interested to see what you would make of if you were to pick this up is, um, uh, you know, Mohammed Ali sends uh, a delegation of students to uh, to Paris uh, in, I think, I think 1826. And alongside this delegation of students uh, is uh, an Asarite uh, theologian by the name of uh, Rifai Al-Tahtawi. Maybe you've, you've, you already know this, um, but it, it features in, 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 in Zeynep Çelik's display, displaying the Orient as well. And he produces an account of his time there and they're there until 1831, Rihla journey. There's a, a nice English translation too um, um, that you can work from where he's obsessed uh, about mirrors in public spaces uh, in, uh, in, in, in Paris and in Marseille. And he, you know, not only describes them physically, but then sort of forms poetic texts that associate uh, um, reflections of oneself um, as a, as a, with, with sort of some sort of Sufi context that might be might be interesting for you uh, uh, to unpack. And so now I, I'm going to suspend my 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 role as a um, you know, a, a reviewer of your narrative and pose a few questions if you don't mind to have a you know back and forth, but you know I'll, I'll ensure that I keep it short so that the audience po pose uh, more questions. But um, I was very intrigued by, whether you came across any archival material or, or any letter, uh, uh, lettered evidence of how these two objects uh, were allowed by the Ottoman administration into uh, the, 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 the mosque and the tomb of the prophet um, in the mosque. Because you can't just send, you know, no matter how wealthy you are and how high up in the 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 the, the, the elite echelons of, of of officialdom you are, you can't just say, you know, 
here are these two monster candelabras. Can you please put them at the very important segment of the of of the mosque? So that's one question that I that I had, and I I you know, um, and within that, whether in those letters, if they do exist, uh, what kind of wording is used about the, these objects and about the sort of plea in bringing them in and whatnot? So that's my first question, and I'll let you if you you know um, answer. Thank you so much for your comments and um, really pointing me in so many directions that you know are very fruitful. Um, so to answer your question, there is archival material about the delivering of these candelabra. Um, it is between um, the uh, Egyptian officials sending it to the uh, Ottoman officials and in it they specifically show that they're worried of its rejection so that was something very interesting that you know actually something that's so clear to you uh that maybe they would like you can't just put a candelabra in the middle of this holy space to me I didn't even think about it and then once I saw that document I was like oh there was a possibility of it being rejected um so in that letter they ask for uh for it to not be rejected so it is a request do not reject it and also a request to put it together because they don't come fully assembled uh and also to have sort of a ceremony in when they do sort of bring it to i use the words pomp and circumstance i'm not exactly sure to what extent they would have liked that but there was a request for a ceremony as well that, that's amazing that they actually probably it comes with a with a construction manual on how to put it together because you know you normally you send in a you know a specialist along to put it together for you but of course this is such a sacred site that you can't just send in a you know a, a candelabra specialist or glass specialist to do it but so thank you for I mean it's it's very exciting for me and along with that and I'll I'll, I'll this 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 will be my my second and you know last question on and then we can turn to the audience and we discussed a little bit before everybody joined in but but whether there are whether you we think that you'll come across walk documents that will tell you how along with the arrival of these the, this set but also the Mejidian set uh whether the structure of the walk um changes to you know increase the number of employees to light these things um you know again how they are conceived in waqf documents what kind of words are used to describe them i love the sejere uh, kandil as a as a as a tree of lights um we can talk you know separately about sejere as a kind of genealogical term to connect you know muhammad's light to those who are praying we could we could you could do so much with it um, uh, whether you expect that you'll see, um, uh, you know, this sort of technological insertion be reflected um, in, in, in WACF documents. Yeah, that's a great point. I think um, one of the issues is, is exactly that, it's terminology. How do I find the exact correct candelabra? Um, because there are there's a lot of usage of the word shamdan, which can just mean candle holder. Um, so the main thing that I'm looking for is crystal, bilur, because that's something that you won't find uh, earlier. And so uh, going through documents and finding mentions of bilur is how I've been approaching it so far. And so hopefully I can find some more uh, documents. Um, and there are mentions of uh you know, trees of light before these crystal candelabra, but that was literally a palm tree um, with lamps. So to see that transition from the palm trees in the court of uh, Medina, which had lamps on them, trans translate into the candelabra, a lot of Hajj certificates, I'm not exactly sure if it's a candelabra or a lit tree. Um, so that's something to keep in mind too, that there's a lot of ambiguity there, but the word bilur is usually the one that's the most enlightening, actually. <laughs> Thank you so much. I will uh, yield the floor to uh, to, to uh, Zainab Chili. And I will yield the floor to our audience with questions. 
Maybe I can just open up with one question. It's a marginal question, Sharon, and I want to thank you for your very beautiful paper, so well constructed and so well researched. As I read it and as I heard you speak it, I was quite, I was, I was uh, worried, uh, not worried, what shall I say, I was curious where the 19th century factory in Bacos stood in the midst of all this. John Webilura, Fabricate Humayu, no? You, I don't think you've mentioned it in your paper either. Was there no competition? And like Dennis, I was quite uh, surprised that Istanbul allowed them to take the candelabra to uh, the holy places. So, um, I mean, if you could explain this obsession with European glass and where the 19th century fact factory stands in the midst of all this, that would be very useful, I think, at least for me. <laughs> Yes, thank you. So in even larger version of this paper, I do think about Bekos because there's a lot to be said about the ways that at this moment, they're thinking about glass and religion, glass and Sufism, and embedding a lot of the ideas of Sufism in the production of Bekos glass. Um, at least that's what I've read in uh, other people's works. Um, and it's something that's taking off in the 19th century, and it's establishing it at a very similar time period, but the production of is focused more on, you know, magnificent smaller pieces. Whereas here we have the awe of just the spectacular enormity of these objects, I think is what's pushing um, their, the consume the royal consumers to purchase European glass as well as Bacos glass. But if Bacos glass doesn't really, um, doesn't really capture the attention in the same way. It's maybe a more complicated, compl uh, complicated, complicated piece. So I think um, for for me the the reason why I decided to exclude Bakos was just focusing on large pieces, um, and they were just not creating the sim similar scale. Um, and also, in another place that we can think about it is in the world's fairs and exhibitions we have the comparison of these sort of large chandeliers with the smaller pieces as well um, on the displays. And that's where, that's another place that we see them sort of talked about in the same realm, but otherwise they seem to be conceived as two different sort of uh, objects. And really it's the monstrosity of the crystal. Like if you can just imagine the shining crystal um, and it's just so large. And then also the crystal uh, fountain at the World Fair is by Osler as well. So that's um, really what they're skilled at is creating these showpieces. So they become sort of one of the main companies to be commissioned for these larger showpieces. But it's something that I have to sort of think about in relation to, I think, glass and religion and glass and taste. Um, and include it in that sort of framework. Okay, thank you. So it seems like the Bacos factory made a decision not to produce that kind of enormous um, <laughs> works of, of candle. Or not to pursue it. I'm, I mean, I'm not sure how much, because even the Bacos factory, they sent... Uh, <clears throat> people out to Vienna, oh, sorry, to uh, Italy to learn glass making as well. So the the Birmingham glass factories had a proprietary uh, sort of, the, their candelabras were proprietary and we actually have their um, books of them requesting a copyright on all of their candelabras. So I think the method of creating these large pieces was also very difficult. Uh, and that's why the center becomes France and England, because they're not sharing how they're making it. Thank you. There is, I see only one question, which is whether this paper is going to be available to the public and when? Uh, I'm still working on it. So any feedback you have today, will go into working on this and hopefully submitting it uh, in the future.
And is it going to be published in JOTSA? Is that the idea? I don't know. Uh, yes, traditionally, we do consider uh, the winners of this graduate student paper prize as potential submissions for JOTSA after the review process. I think it will be published. Yes, I think so. Good to know that. And Gamze Ilaslan has a question. Thank you very much for this uh, inspiring um, presentation. And somebody working on the Adamer Habsburg material culture and diplomacy. So I'm very uh, happy to hear this presentation. I would like to ask about what do we know about the lightning elements used in the Adamer palace? So do they so do they show similar patterns that we have shown um, in these visuals? And what does the form, I mean the materiality, tell us, such as such as leaf ornaments, the size of the object, it's being made of crystal. And how the historian uh, can take it as a um, historical evidence, uh, this materiality. Thank you very much. Thank you for your questions. I'm actually going to share my screen quickly and uh, show you some extra images I have. So this is a representation of the of Domobace Palace. Um, as you can see, it's full of chandeliers and candelabra. And um, there's this one very famous piece at Domobace, which I couldn't include. It's the uh, Prismatic Mirrors by De Vries and Sons, uh, which is in it's sort of just small prism mirrors that reflect light in every direction in Domobace, especially commissioned uh, and designed by the Ottomans uh, and then displayed in the, I think, 1862 World Fair. Um, so as you see, the Ottoman palaces, just like, uh, let me go further here, and we have here an, a famous uh, chandelier as well. Um, as well as the Iranian palaces here as Golestan were filled with very similar looking uh, candelabra and chandeliers. And so, you know, then we can kind of get a sense as to why the Austria-Hungary company calls them the candelabra of the infidels ballroom, because you'll see them very similar objects in palaces, in ballrooms, opera houses, um, and mosques um, and tombs. So I think there's something to be said about who is able to purchase these objects. They're quite expensive. So their consumers are always going to be the elite, um, if not just plain royals. Um, and then often they'll have replicas uh, of cheaper materials. So not exactly crystal made for sort of, you know, the lower elites or even for common people, they sort of sometimes advertise, you can also own the chandelier of the queen in your home and they'll make a you know a knockoff cheap version for the common so i think in this moment what we're seeing is the manufacturers establishing themselves as luxury brands and they're sort of reaching you know the kajars they're reaching um East Asia, I have lots of examples from there as well. And what's happening is that, you know, this sort of taste between you know, the British have maybe a certain taste and the Ottomans have a certain taste, that's all being erased here. And what we're seeing is a, a taste of the elite um, and a competition between not just the Ottomans and the Qajars, but the Ottomans and the Queen of England purchasing very similar candelabra um, from the same companies. Um, so I think there's something very interesting happening at this moment with these, you know, it's like today we have luxury brand handbags and the 19th century, it was chandeliers. So I, and, and I think the material itself was just so new um, and so spectacular, just so eye-catching that it became sort of what the elite were um, sort of gravitating towards. Uh, that's my contention. I'm not, you know, there's obviously many other factors that go into it, but I think the material itself and its brilliance uh, has a part to play in its global reach. So hopefully that answers both your questions about the material as well. Yeah, it does. And um, maybe 
I think it is also important that there is no human figures in this um, in these objects. So um, I don't know whether it's a part of their um, purchase uh, strategy or not, but um, as far as I, in my experience in the diplomatic meetings, um, so such human figures um, were not considered as appropriate. So either they are floral designs or monumentals were included uh, in order to sell them in the other market. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, and actually there's this idea that the factories are building, uh, or sorry, are, built, are creating these pieces with um, the India in mind specifically, because they are British factories. And I can share one more image here. So, you know, often the way that uh, these companies are described, uh, for example, this is the showpiece for the Osler stand in the 1862 World Fair designed by Owen Jones. And they're designed in a way to keep in mind their Eastern customers. That's generally the argument that is made for these factories. I'm not sure if I agree with it because I think um, you'll find similar similarly dis, you know described eastern objects in the homes of e european royals as well so i think there's an elite taste happening here and it includes um things like this there doesn't seem to be any more questions that i can see I think Baki has a question. Uh, maybe Baki has a question. I don't think he does, but. Oh, oh no, yes. no, I, I, I did raise my hand. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation, Sharon. I, I wanted to highlight uh, a couple of things and then ask a question. The, 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 just in the picture you cho showed recently from Golestan Palace, you said it's actually from the Ottoman Palace archives. So the the Ottomans were keeping an eye on what they are doing, just like earlier in the 18th century, they were looking at, uh, you know, I'm reminded of Shirin Hamadeh's article about uh, how uh, the Lale Devri was actually, there was also a lot of inspiration from um, Safavid Persia and here they keep an eye on it. That is very interesting to note. We always think of the 19th century as the moment when they are moving all westward, but clearly they want to know what is going on over there so that they can keep up. Uh, so the, 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 the Joneses, as they would say here, right? The, the other side of the fence. Uh, so that is very interesting. Um, my question is, the, about the fact that this came from England, right? You know, it's the land of the Christians, the imperial center. The, the, it, I mean, I'm not quite sure how you could study this. Of course, there are no newspapers probably published in Medina at the time that would have recorded the public um, reaction to this, but is there any evidence anywhere so about how the public perceived the or sort of where they, these things came from? And then in the decades that followed, people who came there to you know visit the mosque were do you think they were aware that these things actually were made in England and then were sent here? Or was that something more like kind of downplayed. Um, do, do you have any inkling, any clues about uh, how the tension between beauty and and yet, you know, this is also a place where identity is so strong and here you I have something from there. Uh, I mean, I guess this is the whole thing you're trying to show us. You're trying to show us that this was in the very center of Islam, but I'm just wondering how the people who actually experienced it and saw it, perceived it, were they aware of it, etc. Yeah, and I think that's at the heart of the question is, to us today, I don't think Burton or Dickens is that far off, right? They seem very gaudy and they seem out of place. 
but that's also something that perhaps is coming from the sort of reproduction of that perspective over and over again. And I think my, my, by bringing in sort of these Hodge certificates, we can see how seamlessly they become incorporated in what is already an existing tradition, which is the patronage of glass in sacred spaces. That is nothing new in the 19th century. And now we have, we, and even I believe the um, image I have, I'm just gonna, oh, I'm, I'm just gonna slide through back a little bit. The Murano glass uh, that I showed is from the Edina, is from an Edina mosque. So even back in the 16th century, it was not strange to have Venetian glass in an Ottoman mosque. So I think there's something that's continuing from an earlier tradition. And now we have uh, this, these candelabra, which is supposed to represent England, um, doesn't necessarily do so. It represents the patron. Um, and so most of the Hodge narratives that I've read mention who patroned the candelabra. They don't mention who made it. Um, and most of them, when they do mention it, I mean, there was many I read that don't mention it, of course, but the ones that do just mention their beauty and their size. Um, so I'm not sure if they don't know that it's British. I assume they do because to create such large works of glass, it was, if you knew anything about glass, you'd know that they're coming from Britain or France. Um, but it's just not a significant part. Thank you. Thank you. It, I, it's very helpful for you to spell out the significant sort of differentiation between the patron and the maker. Maybe maybe the, the leadership by bringing this out, the, by owning it, uh, sort of mediates the question of them being uh, foreign. That is what makes them local. And then, yes, they might be they might have been made in Britain, but it is the Sultan who sent them. It is the Pasha who sent them, etc. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dennis, you have another question. Sorry, I, I don't want to. If it's if we're out of time, I can totally resolve. I, actually, I'll hold back. I think there's another hand. Uh, Zainab Hoja, maybe you want to give them Nicole the floor. Nicole Hayat. Okay, Nicole Hayat. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, that was fascinating, uh, fascinating talk. And I realized that chandeliers is a, a completely different um, scale of everything. But if we're just looking at the glass, glass was invented, uh, I mean, greater Syria or part of the Ottoman Empire, right? And in the 19th century, there is a lot of um, trade with glass uh, of antiques that the West and the, the wealthy people in the West and the museums were very eager to acquire. So, um, so there are two things here. One is the, like the um, kind of a reciprocity. And another thing that I find in other things that I work on is that if, if the, and I'm, I'm okay, so I'm, I'm putting, dressing it on the, the idea of glass. Okay, so if, if glass is, the source of glass is from, from here, then uh, if the West takes it and, and does some sort of innovation to it, it's still ours. Um, so maybe that's also kind of an explanation why it doesn't really matter because um, it's just another kind of, um, um, I don't know, another step in it, but it's not something new. Um, anyway, thank you. Thank you, Dennis, you wanna? ask your question unless Sharon has an answer in that case I I you know Sharon yeah, I mean it's, to it's something to think about is the sort of not only the Syrian origin of glass but also in the 19th century the sort of renewed interest in purchasing you know 13th and 12th century glass from Syria and bringing them to museums um but I think you know, and I think that shows in the way that the candelabra seamlessly fit with the lamps between each arch, which would most definitely be from uh, Syria, if not sort of replicas of that model of lamp. Um, and they're still there. Or the, I mean, those are the lamps that are taken uh, back to Istanbul um, because they're so easily 
able to be packed and moved. Um, but they are in museums today in Istanbul. Sharon, sorry, I think my 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 question um, uh, has to do with: Do you know whether Ibrahim Pasha ordered other things along with these two candelabra? Because it's no, you know, you tend to sort of ship these objects over, and they almost, I mean, they're too small for a big ship to carry. So, and it's almost always the case, at least in all these imported goods that I, I have seen from Europe and, and, or, and or England, uh, that there's almost, there's almost always other things that have been purchased from the same pack factory. And it's often military goods. Um, so, you know, you buy five ships alongside those five ships, they send you, you know, some other, you know, domestic beautiful object that you put in your, in your palace or whatever else. So, you know, and these 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 little objects, smaller objects tend to be, um, you know, gift gifted, you know, you don't necessarily have to pay for them because you've ordered such a, you know, mighty order. So I, I'm just curious that in 1847, he goes to Birmingham, and he's most likely buying other things. Uh, and what these things are, uh, I would very, very, I'd be very curious to know. Yes, uh, there's um, British press following him through Birmingham and sort of you know, every day they say, okay, well, he's bought something from this place. Now he's bought something from this place. It was a full out shopping spree uh, in Birmingham. And the candelabra, you know, stood out because they, to the British, they were works of art. Um, but in the Ottoman sources, when uh, there, so I talked about the um, Istanbul having to pay for the uh, candles and the oils for these candelabra. Uh, they always mention chandeliers and candelabra, crystal chandeliers and candelabra. So I'm assuming there's a set um, of chandeliers as well that came along, but they're not so mentioned in the sources because I'm, I mean, when I looked at older photographs, there's just, uh, there's a, a lot of chandelab candle or chandeliers in the space. So I can't quite pick out which ones were his um, in the same way that I can very clearly pick out the candelabra in a photograph. Um, but yes, there is definitely chandeliers. There's also um, gold objects sent over and bronze objects sent over. Um, so from other factories, I assume. Thank you all. Um, Baki, I'll pass it on to you and see if you have any final comments to make. Sure. Actually, uh, I see a, a, a comment um, in the chat that I might want to read. Um, thank you so much, Sharon. I work on Hajj. I see a lot of references to these kinds of concerns in South Asian Hajj literature. Would like to have a chat with you later. All right. And then the other one. Okay. Not, not a question, really. All right. Um, did you come across evidence that, oh, there is one question here from Alessi Demir. Thank you for a beautiful and very insightful presentation. I cannot wait to read your paper in full once it becomes available. As you mentioned while answering Ms. Mrs. Ilaslan's question, in your research, did you come across evidence that this elite taste was segregated between European and Ottoman Eastern, or was there solely homogenous regard among nobility for the beauty and features of these works? Um, is there something you could tell about this, Sharon? Yes. So the main um, book written about the Birmingham class companies, uh, that's the main argument is that uh, the taste has is in the 19th century becoming segregated or it always was that there is sort of an Indian idea of beauty and glass and beautiful glasswork. And then there's the British idea of beautiful glasswork. Um, and so the argument of that book is that the Osler uh, company, realizing that there's a better market in India, starts to produce more Orientalist looking items. Now, I think for this period that I'm looking at, I don't see that to be the case because the Queen of England purchases an almost replica of these candelabra, of the Abraham Pasha candelabra for herself. Uh, in in 1848, the King of Nepal also purchases an almost replica of the candelabra 
for himself. So in the moments that I'm looking at, people are purchasing replicas of each other's work. Um, but I think there's something to be said with Owen Jones coming onto the scene um, and, you know, with the world exhibitions taking sort of taking off, that there is perhaps a separation being built between an Eastern market and a Western market that's maybe being imposed by the glassmakers themselves. They also set up shops in India um, and sort of house, uh, what's the word, showrooms in India for the sort of nobility there. But at the same time, you know, the nobility in England is buying, you know, brilliant colored glass as well. Um, they're also purchasing sort of ruby looking like glass. So I think there's this push towards discerning a taste of sort of the Oriental despot and the sort of the British, uh, what's the word? So the British uh, man with taste, uh, he would never purchase such a gaudy piece, but I think that's something that's being built up in the narrative of sort of individuals like Owen Jones. Thank you. I, I had one more um, quick question. Uh, the, you said when the Ottomans lost the city uh, after you know a long defense, they tried to take some of these back, but some were left. Is, did I understand that correctly? So some of these things were actually carried back to Istanbul? Yes. Um, most of the objects were carried back to Istanbul in, I think it was 1917. I have to look at my paper again, but uh, in the early 20th century, uh, they okay. were removed. The, the, that, is, that is very interesting in, in the sense that, I mean, you know, sometimes we ask the question whether something is done for charity or for power and how you can really display of power, how you can really differentiate the two. In this particular case, it's very clear. I mean, it, it is a Muslim space. It's going to remain as a Muslim space. The profit is still going to be there, but because the Ottomans no longer have it, they take it back. So I, I, I think that is also worth highlighting that uh, the, the, this was all about projection of power and in that space. And if they no longer have it, they'd rather keep it at home because that's where uh, they think that that it belongs. That's that that's how. Right. I I'm just uh, sort of thinking to myself. That's interesting. You I, you might it, it, because it's at the heart of Muslim space. And so if you're doing something for charity purposes, you would just leave it, it because it's not like you know the British are taking over. It's uh, another Muslim uh, dynasty taking over. And thank. Thank you so, so much for this wonderful presentation. And uh, thank you, Zeynep Ojam, for moderation. Thank you, Deniz Ojam, for your the, uh, co contribution as the commentary discussion. Thank you for the audience, uh, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And hopefully some of you might consider joining us next Friday or uh, next month with other Turkey Now or WhatsApp meetings. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.